Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. This is already session 10, and uh, we're still dealing with semantics, the study of meaning in language. And in this video, I will talk about metaphor, metonymy, and prototype theory. Now, what did we do last time? Um, last time, I introduced three different types of meaning. Referential meaning, on the one hand, and uh, social and effective meaning on the other hand. Now, referential meaning is what's talked about in terms of denotation, the denotation of a word. And I distinguish between uh, the referent of a word, um, so a reference of the word. Here I have a referent of a word, of the word shoe. And there's a sense of the word shoe, the general idea of what it is like to to be a shoe yeah okay so that's referential meaning reference pointing to things in the world sense the general idea of something um, besides referential meaning there's also social meaning um, there i gave the example of lift versus elevator which you know, words that allow you to infer something about the social background of a speaker and there is effective meaning, um, words that allow you to infer something about the emotional stance of the speaker. Right, so um, words may actually share their referential meaning, their denotation, but they may differ in social and effective meaning. So they may differ in what's called connotation. Then we also talked about sense relations, and I um, discussed a whole range of different sense relations that words can be in. For instance, words can be in a sense relation of hyponymy. That would be a category relationship, uh, things like vehicle and car. Or uh, there are meronymic sense relations, so a relation between a whole and its parts, car and engine. Um, words can be in a relation of synonymy, um, where you have two words that denote roughly the same referent. Um, words can be in a relationship of converseness, doctor, patient, uncle, nephew, uh, professor, student. Words can be antonyms, heavy and light. Um, words can be homonyms, things like bat, uh, <clears throat> looks like one word, it's really two separate words denoting very different things, and words can be polysemous, that would be one word having several interrelated meanings, like table, for instance. Okay, this time then, um, we'll be talking about metaphor, metonymy, and prototype theory. <clears throat> and let's start with metaphor right away. Uh, if you want, you can pause this video, take a sheet of paper, and answer the following two questions. What do you think is an example of metaphor, and where do you expect to find metaphorical language? So, ready, set, go. And uh, I'm going to continue here. Um, well, what's an example of metaphor? Um, <clears throat> An example that would be not very inventive is John is a lion. And usually uh, there are at least you know, two or three people, hands going up, saying John is a lion. That's a metaphor. Yeah, it is. Um, where do we expect to find metaphorical language? Um, we expect to find it in texts that are highly charged with meaning, texts that are works of art, like poetry, and other works of literature. Now what I want to convince you of in this video is that metaphor really is not only found in literary texts but rather it is pervasive in ordinary language, everyday kind of language and you don't even realize it. So um, how do we define metaphor for the purposes of this class? 
I want to propose this definition here, uh, which is reasonably simple, but captures uh, something very important about metaphor, namely the essence of metaphor is understanding one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing. So it's not a matter of words or, or poetry or language, it's rather a matter of thought. Yeah? Mm. It's a matter of you know, understanding something in terms of another thing. And an example that I want to give here for this uh, thinking of one thing in terms of another thing um, is arguments. And um, here are a few examples. She attacked every weak point in my argument. Your claims are indefensible. You're going to get a lot of flack for those suggestions. Uh, they had to surrender to the force of our arguments. What's going on here is that people are talking about arguing, but at the same time, they're using words that come from a different semantic domain, namely the domain of yeah, uh, armed conflict, fighting. So um, this has been taken to suggest that uh, being in an argument is actually viewed and talked about in terms of fighting, fighting a war. Um, so the metaphor that is supposed to underlie these expressions is uh, the argument is war metaphor. So if you want the cognitive habit of viewing arguing as a case of armed conflict. What goes on in the mapping of this kind is that you have two so-called domains. Okay, War, that's a semantic domain. Arguing, that's another semantic domain. And uh, both of these domains have participants, aspects um, that characterize them. And between those two domains there are links so that one part of the war domain maps onto a part of the arguing domain. For instance, uh, in a war we have fighting parties, armies if you like. Um, these correspond to the arguing participants in a heated discussion. Yeah. Um, in a war, there are certain things you can do. For instance, you can attack. This corresponds to raising an objection or presenting an argument in the domain of arguing. Defending in war uh, corresponds to maintaining your opinion in an argument. Surrendering in war uh, corresponds to giving up on your opinion in the domain of arguments. Right, um, so is this just one example? Is all of this coincidence? Um, well, there's evidence that no, it's, it's really more systematic than that. Human, human beings um, quite often understand things that are abstract, not well understood, complicated, in terms of simpler things. Yeah? So the simple things are what's called the source domain, and the more complicated things are called the target domains. Um, here's another example. <clears throat> it's also a bit uh, about fighting, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, let me first read the examples to you. Uh, since 1998, the virus has invaded southern and central Europe, killing over 1.8 million animals so far. I think that was the swine flu. Yeah. Um, or the bird flu, not really sure. Um, we're losing the fight against tuberculosis. Um, he has been battling his disease with, with homeopathic uh, medication. The spread of the deadly severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, is dealing a heavy blow to commercial activities in Taiwan. What's being talked about in these examples are diseases, yeah, sicknesses. And um, they're being talked about not in terms of bacteria, medical causes, um, chemical processes, but rather in terms of warfare. Yeah? So diseases are talked about in terms of enemy. The virus has invaded Europe. Um, we're losing the fight. He has been battling. Um, something is dealing a heavy blow, and so on and so forth. Diseases are enemies. Let's look at this in more detail. Um, here are the mappings between the two domains. Again, war, that's the source domain, and disease, uh, the more abstract, 
complicated domain, that's the target domain. So in war we have enemies or invaders that maps onto germs or viruses in the domain of disease. Attacking and invading that maps onto infection. <clears throat> you, in, in war you can you can fight the invader, that means you're trying to heal uh, a disease. In war you use ammunition, in uh, clinical treatment you use medication, and victory in a war equals recovery from disease. One final example that I want to give you concerns scientific disciplines, and here it's not about war. Okay. Um, again, I'll read the examples first. He has published in the field of cognitive psychology. My dissertation straddles the line between linguistics and philosophy. That's a fictive example. Um, the article goes beyond the traditional boundaries of particle physics, and uh, this finding has opened up entirely new areas of research. What transpires from these examples is that we talk about scientific disciplines in terms of something that we know very well, namely physical space. Scientific disciplines are spatial areas. And so, um, well, uh, in the domain of space, there are areas you get from one place to, to another, and that corresponds to a scientific discipline. If you are in the domain of space uh, between two areas, you're in a borderline region, uh, that corresponds in the science domain to working on two disciplines or to being familiar with two disciplines. Uh, you can move across boundaries in space. That corresponds to changing your discipline in science. And um, in space, you, well at least you, back in the day you could discover new territory and give it your own name, Martin Island. Um, yeah, no longer possible, really. Um, that corresponds to scientific discovery, where still you could you know, make a discovery and give it your own name. Hilpert's Law. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Right, um, so again we have the mapping from one domain to another. Right then, to summarize, a uh, metaphor viewed in this way is a cognitive phenomenon, it's a way of thinking that is based on our capacity to think uh, of one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing. And then the fact that we talk about one thing in terms of another thing, that's just a natural consequence, really. Metaphor involves mappings of concepts from one semantic domain onto another domain, and uh, the whole thing actually has a purpose. Yeah, It helps us understand, or uh, metaphorically speaking, get a grip on complex abstract phenomena, unfamiliar topics, or any other semantic domain that is less well structured, less well understood. Yeah, metaphor, that's a fun topic. So, um, again, here's a little exercise um, for you guys. What's the metaphor? Uh, read the following examples and identify at least three mappings between source domain and target domain, and then uh, you can speculate a little bit on why you think the writers chose these, uh, this metaphor. I'll read the examples to you, then you can hit pause and, um, yeah, and do the exercise. Um, here are the sentences. Uh, the Iraqi democracy is still in its infancy. Only a stable, prolonged U.S. troop presence and a weak Iraqi army will allow us to nurture democracy. That's not even a made-up example. I <laughs> it's real stuff. Um, the correct U.S. policy is thus to stay the course and provide security until Iraqi democracy is strong enough to survive on its own. Yeah. I'll move on to metonymy, another cool topic. Um, now, metaphor is mapping from one domain to another semantic domain. Metonymy, there everything goes on within a single semantic domain, and um, it's a mapping within the domain from one entity to another related entity. Let me give you a few examples. Um, how much for that Picasso? He likes to read Paul Auster. Shakespeare is on the top shelf. What's going on here? Well, 
uh, of course they're selling not Picasso the person but Picasso the painting yeah uh, he likes to read Paul Auster um, it's the books and Shakespeare same thing uh, the underlying metonymy that licenses these examples is sometimes called the producer for product um, metonymy so you mention the producer but what you're um, denoting what you're referring to that's the product another famous metonymy so to speak is the part for whole metonymy uh, particularly part for person part of the person for the whole person in sentences like I see a whole of new faces around here I probably also see their bodies uh, we need a couple of strong bodies for our team your brain you can leave at home uh, or give it to Google yeah Google hired the best brains the bodies had to stay home no they didn't um, right another metonymy uh, is the cause for effect metonymy um, if I say uh, this is a sad movie it's not really that the movie is, is sad uh, it's the cause of your sadness that's the movie cause for effect um, instrument for player that's another metonymy the violin has the flute today um, place for event Pearl Harbor still has an effect on US foreign policy today date for event 9-11 yeah um, France beat Brazil in the World Cup um, well sometimes you have representatives of the country being talked about uh, by just naming the country okay summing up then metonymy is uh, when you refer to one entity by means of another related entity from the same semantic domain so the two entities are uh, what what you could call semantically contiguous uh, so there is a semantic shift within the same semantic domain and uh, metonymic principles <coughs> have the form of X for Y, yeah, part for whole, cause for effect, producer for product, and so on and so forth. One thing that I didn't want to keep from you is um, this year, uh, inherently metonymic concepts. Um, for instance, the word recipe is interesting in that it you know, <clears throat> refers to subtly different nuances shades of, of meaning that are closely related uh, take an example like this recipe is tasty and simple uh, you find it on page 27 in my book muffins made easy okay the recipe is tasty tasty things that you eat they are tasty simple that is an activity an activity is simple when I'm playing the guitar that's simple um, so things that you can eat are not really simple um, you know, eating them can be difficult sometimes but that's not what's meant here uh, <clears throat> um, okay you can find it on page 27 well the thing that you eat you don't find on page 27 what you do find on page 27 is an instruction how to make uh, the stuff that you eat and uh, the activity that is described is simple so that's how it all makes sense slightly different shades of meaning um, I'll leave you guys to to figure out the shades of meaning in the next two examples here this big book is a history of Canada it came out first in 1920 but I've got the third edition the Zeppelin was a great invention but it was prone to accidents and it has almost no role in today's aviation yeah. um, another little exercise so you can again pause the video if you like uh, identify the metonymic relation. France opposed the war in Iraq. Spaghetti are my favorite dish. He turned in his final paper via email. I got my first real six string. The ham sandwich left without paying. And this weekend, Britain goes to the ballot. That brings us to the third and last topic for this video, namely prototype theory. Um, prototype theory really is about categorization categorizing things uh, seeing something as a kind of thing yeah a member of a group 
um, and the categories that we have reflect our interpretation of things in the world. For instance, um, <clears throat> we have a word in English, uh, pet, yeah, pets. And pets are animals that you keep at home as companions for pleasure. And you consider them your friends. And then there are other animals that um, I call farm animals, maybe. Animals that you um, keep on a farm, you feed them, and eventually you kill and eat them. They're not your friends. They're useful, but um, you, you don't keep them for pleasure, you keep them for a purpose. And you see how different peoples in the world might arrive at slightly different conceptualization of what is a pet and what is a farm animal that is eventually to be eaten. Yeah, so those are, no, that's categorization. Um, pet represents a cognitive category and says something about your world view. <clears throat> um, now with categories there has been a classic view uh, that's been established for thousands and thousands of years, the so-called Aristotelian approach to categories. The, the young man here, that's um, the man himself, Aristotle. Um, and Aristotle came up with the, well, maybe someone came up with it earlier, but uh, he championed the idea that categories are defined by necessary and sufficient criteria. <clears throat> So you can list the properties that things need to have to belong to a category. Um, these criteria are inherent in the category members, meaning that, you know, if, <clears throat> um, no, if something is an animal, then it has inherent qualities. For instance, that it lives, or that it breathes, or uh, that it reproduces, something like that. Um, and the criteria that you can use to come up with categories, they are binary. So something either is breathing or it is not breathing. If it's not breathing, it's not an animal. So something is either in the category or it's not in the category. Easy as that. And um, also, um, what, what comes with this view of categories is that every instance of a category represents that category equally well. Um, an example for this is, um, well, squares, okay? A square, it's a closed flat figure. It has four sides, something with three sides, not a square. All sides are equal in length. If something has four sides, but those aren't equal in length, not a square. And all interior angles are equal. Something um, where, you know, you have four sides, equal in length, but unequal angles. I don't know if that log that's logically possible, but uh, that's that would be not a square. So this includes all true squares and excludes rectangles, triangles, circles, freeforms, and so on and so forth. Good category. Um, and <clears throat> by extension, we could think that, okay, that's really how we define the meaning of words. So, um, we have sparrows, those are birds, blue jays are birds, ostriches are birds, roadrunners are birds, and um, birds, that's a category, bird, and um, so it must be that all of these um, hyponyms, yeah, I can say it now, um, have some inherent characteristics that make them birds. Now, there are problems with that. Um, we'll get to those problems eventually, but um, the idea has been actually quite popular uh, in linguistics, where it has been pursued uh, under the umbrella of um, semantic feature analysis. That's sometimes called the essential features approach. So, um, this is a kind of checklist theory of word meaning, where meaning is defined in terms of semantic features that are binary, that is, you can prefix them with a plus or with a minus, and these features are both necessary and sufficient, clearly 
Aristotelian. And as long as all the features are present, every instance of the category is equally representative of the category. So to uh, illustrate how this works in practice, let's define man, woman, boy, and girl. And you see that man and woman, uh, they're both plus human and plus adult, but one is plus male, the other is minus male. Boy and girl, they're both uh, plus human and minus adult, but one is plus male and one is minus male. Yeah. Um, this way of viewing linguistic meaning has had a uh, fair share of success, but really um, there are problems associated with it. For instance, there are problems with essential features. Um, many words that we use every day <clears throat> resist a characterization in terms of essential features, um, which um, is revealed by an attempt to define words such as, for instance, game. Okay. Um, if you want, you can pause the video again and try to define game or look it up in a dictionary or do something. Um, or you can just, you know, stay with me. Um, what are the defining features of a game? Well, in many games you have opponents, you know, team A, team B, player A, player B. Um, many games are played for fun. Super Mario. Does anybody still play Super Mario? Um, there are winners and losers. <coughs> or, uh, you know, first place, second place, and so on and so forth. And uh, in many games you need luck or, or skills to do well. Yeah, okay. What then are the problems with this definition? Say that these four are the defining characteristics, the necessary and sufficient features for, for games. Well, uh, there are games in which there are no opponents. If you think of this um, toddler game here, so the kid is supposed to you know, recognize the different shapes and put them in the globe. There's really no opponent, unless you want to count the globe as the opponent that is stubborn and <laughs> it's difficult to deal with. Nah, there's really no opponent. It's just the kid playing. Um, not all games are played for fun. For instance, there are professional golf players, professional tennis players, and they do this um, because it's their job, essentially. Sure, they have fun doing their job, but um, I have fun doing my job and I don't call it a game because of that. Maybe I should. Um, winners and losers. Well, there are games um, without losers. You need luck or skills. Well, arguably there are also games where you don't need either, really. Um, <clears throat> so, bottom line, sometimes all of the features are present, but sometimes one is missing, sometimes several are missing, and still we would call something a game. And that is puzzling. That's a problem for the Aristotelian view of categories. I brought you a little quote here from a famous man, um, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and he famously said, what still counts as a game and what no longer does? Can you give the boundary? No. You can draw one, for none so far has been drawn, and then parentheses, but that never troubled you when you used the word game. Yeah, that's profound and true. Let's move on. Um, another problematic case, and a fun one, uh, from a linguistic point of view, is the word lie. Yeah, the word lie, like the word game, has uh, certain prototypical features. Like someone says something that's false, that the speaker believes to be false, and that is said in order to deceive somebody else. Easy enough. But um, let's get to some more problematic cases. Is this a lie? We're talking about our friends John and Mary, and Mary is leaving the house to buy John's Christmas present, wanting to keep it a secret. And John um, sees Mary trying to sneak out of the apartment and says, Mary, where are you going? And Mary says, oh, we're out of milk. And they actually are out of milk. 
Now, of course, Mary says this in order to keep it a secret that she's trying to buy John's Christmas present, and she's saying something that is um, deceitful, but it's not false. They are out of milk, and uh, the speaker does not believe uh, this statement to be false. She knows that they actually are out of milk. Um, now, is this still a lie? <clears throat> I'll leave that up to you to, to ponder for a few seconds, and if you need more time, then you can hit pause. Okay, so we've seen that there are problems with necessary and sufficient features, but there are also problems with the idea that each category member represents its category equally well. Um, and you can do experiments to bring this point home. There are goodness of example ratings, for instance, where people have presented um, unsuspecting normal people with a slide like this one and they've asked them are these good examples of the category furniture rate them from one very good to seven not so good so is a piano a furniture is a table a piece of furniture is a TV a piece of furniture um, there have been famous uh, studies along these lines not only for furniture, but also for things like bird, fruit, vehicle, or weapon. And you see that a chair is a top furniture, really. That's a great furniture. A telephone, on the other hand, is kind of a furniture, but not really. Um, yeah, a robin or sparrow, those are really good birds, but uh, penguins aren't, and bats aren't either. <clears throat> Um, oranges and apples are great fruit, but coconuts and avocados, ah, are those really fruits? Okay, um, another way to get at this um, point, uh, are, are all members of a category created equal or not, is speed of verification. And uh, let me demonstrate this a little bit. Um, here the subjects in an experiment see a computer, you sit them in front of a computer screen and they see things like the following screens. Um, so are the following sentences true or not? Answer as fast as you can, yes or no. Okay, and you can do this at home. Um, ready, set, go. A robin is a bird, yes. A duck is a fish, no. A penguin is a bird, yes. Okay, so people are quite fast to say a robin is a bird. That's easy. Um, negation takes longer, that's a different story. But they're also taking longer to uh, verify that a penguin is a bird. It's not so easily done as with robins and sparrows. Thirdly, there are so-called priming effects. Mm, and again, this can be demonstrated experimentally. Um, again, let me walk you through the experimental design. You sit people in front of a screen, tell them, okay, on the following screen you will see a word. Just look at the word and then people see furniture and that's called the prime. Yeah, so the idea of furniture is planted in the minds of the subjects. And then they get what's called a lexical decision task, which essentially is the question, is the following a word of English? Answer yes or no as fast as possible. <clears throat> and then, um, well, you can flash the word chair. That would be called the stimulus. And people would be expected to say, yes, yes, that's a word. That's a word. I know that word. I've seen it. I've used it. Um, yeah. Um, of course, there are also words that are not really words, things like snurple, yeah? and there people were, would be supposed to say no. Okay, priming effects. Uh, after seeing a prime like furniture, speakers verify the word chair more quickly than usual. If you prime them with fish and then ask them to uh, verify chair, yeah? it take just a few milliseconds longer. Um, and after seeing furniture, speakers do not verify ashtray more quickly as usual. Um, so ashtray, we can conclude, 
is not a good furniture. Furniture primes chair, but it doesn't prime ashtray uh, to the same extent. Right. Um, all of this goes to show that degrees that, that there are degrees of category membership. It's not either or. There's a continuum. Um, you can show this through goodness of example ratings. You can show it through speed of category verification experiments. You can do these priming experiments. And what this goes to show is that categories are organized around best examples, around prototypes. Yeah. So the bird category, cognitively speaking, would look something like this. You have a robin or sparrow in the middle, and then you have not so good birds around that. Toucans, owls, parrots, pheasants, and then the worst birds that you can think of are penguins, ostriches, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, so the prototype then is the best or clearest example of the category. It combines all of the typical features uh, that a category is thought to have. So these are maybe not unlike the necessary and sufficient criteria, just that you know, they aren't really necessary, they aren't really sufficient, they're just you know, prototypical. Um, what is the prototype? How does it come about? Well, it results from frequent exposure. Uh, the best bird for middle European uh, speakers is not the prototypical bird for people living um, in Antarctica. Right, and the prototype represents the category as a whole. What evidence is there for prototypes? Well, there are these uh, reaction time experiments. Um, in experiments you can show that the prototypes are first activated and first named. So these are examples, um, experiments like, okay, give me five examples of uh, different types of fruit that you know. If I'd give this to you, all of you would have apple among your top five, unless you're particularly inventive. Um, yeah, surveys, there are rating tasks, is this a good furniture or not, is this a good fruit or not, listing tasks, give me five types of furniture, and of course there's evidence from language acquisition. Later in this class we'll get to language acquisition. Right, and I want to close with this funny anecdote here for, for prototypes. Uh, a young man is involved in an automobile accident in which his father is killed. Seriously injured, the young man is rushed to the emergency room of a hospital and a surgeon is called in. Upon entering and seeing the patient, the surgeon exclaims, Oh my God, I can't possibly operate on my own son. Explain. Yeah. Um, after a while of reflection, usually, um, and, and maybe you do know this uh, thing here, um, the mother is the surgeon, right? There are female surgeons. Trouble is, the prototypical surgeon in your mind is male, and that is a social problem. But it nicely illustrates prototype theory. So, uh, prototype theory then holds that categories are organized around best typical examples, prototypes. To be included in the category, uh, the members must share some characteristic features, but not all. So category membership is a matter of degree. Members resemble each other. There's the term family resemblance. Um, but, and this is crucial, uh, not all members are equally good representatives of the category. And that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, I'll see you next week.